Hello everybody, it is I, Granorite, and here we are back with another episode of Let's Play Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Um, we're getting close to the end of the game. We're at like 91% completed. And um, there's no way we're getting everything upgraded. We, we can probably get everything crafted once we get it unlocked. Uh, but we still, like, we're still missing schematics. Um... And then the cost to upgrade the uh, outfits is so much. We're just we're gonna keep working on stuff, but that's one thing that we're not gonna get completed. And it just takes time to do it because you just need money. We have a couple uh, database entries. So what's what we have? We have the Crimean War, and perhaps the pettiest reason to start a war since the Americans got a bit surely over our borrowing of their sailors in 1812. The Crimean War, 1853 to 1856, began as a disagreement over whether the Catholic or Orthodox Christians should control the churches in the Holy Land. Of course, it was really about whether Britain or Russia was allowed to have the bigger empire, but we don't talk about that in polite society. Uh, Cassus Belli was when Napoleon III sent a warship uh, into the Black Sea to politely suggest that the Ottomans, uh, Suleiman uh, Aldumasid I, crazy name, crazy guy, acknowledge French Catholicism as the authority over Christian sites in the Holy Land. Uh, this rather annoyed Tsar Nicholas I, since up till this point the Eastern Orthodox Church had controlled those sites, and he responded by sending two corps uh, to the banks of the Danube. Uh, diplomatic relations soured from there, and since the British and French were leery of Russian expansionism and had troops in the area anyway, they decided they might as well pitch in on the Ottoman side. As you expect from the name, most of the conflict was fought in Crimea, uh, with the Russian Empire on one side and an alliance of Britain, France, the Ottoman Empire, and Sardinia on the other. It was one of those first truly modern wars. Um, if large masses of men shooting each other over which Toff got, uh, got to call themselves emperor of wherever can be called modern, technology like the exploding artillery shell, the railroad, and the telegraph shaped the conflict, and the advent of the of photographic technology meant it was one of the first wars to be documented in the press. This was particularly delightful in that the great uh, legacy of the Crimean War was the rank incompetence and journal mismanagement on the part of leadership of all sides, something to really be proud of there. If you're going to be inept, be really inept. For the citizens on the home front puffed up with patriotic fervor, uh, this was a bit like going to see your favorite band at concert, only to realize that they only sounded good thanks to auto-tune and ruthless editing. The war ended in 1856 when the Allies took the key Russian city of Sevast Sevastopol. Uh, recognizing the inevitability of defeat, Nicholas I sued for peace, and as part of terms, the Black Sea was declared neutral, Moldavia and Wallachia were made independent, and everyone more or less tried to forget the entire embarrassing debacle. Did it lead to extensive calls for military reform um, and nationalist movements across Eastern Europe, which doesn't seem worth the lives of half a million people, but what do I know? And then we have the Battle of Balakava. Uh, on the 24th of October of 1854, the Allied forces of Britain, France, and the Ottoman Empire had settled in for a long winter siege in the Russian port of Sevastopol. The British under Lord Ragwan took Balakava and the right flank of the siege. Uh, this was a problem because the British didn't actually have the manpower to hold the right flank. See Crimean War, Ari, <laughs> rampant incompetence. Since a weakness, Russian forces, managed, or forces charged the British defenses and managed to capture several redoubts uh, and their artillery pieces. It was a uh, major, though not ultimately significant, victory for the Russians. But the battle is most famous for the uh, Payan to incompetent leadership. I don't know what that word is. P-A-E-A-N. And senseless loss of the life of that is the charge of the Light Brigade. I'm sure you've read the poem. And if not, for God's sakes, go read a book. Cannon to the left of them, cannon to the right of them, etc. There were a lot of cannon is the point. Uh, the whole thing is fraught with ambiguity and uh, crimination on all sides. But broadly, here's how it happened. Lord Raglan, the overall commander of the British forces, gave the order to Lord Lucian, or Lucan, 
um, who commanded the cavalry forces to send the light brigade to harry the Russian forces who had seized artillery pieces on the south side of the battlefield. And unfortunately, the courier who brought the order to Lord uh, Lucian didn't deliver the information clearly enough, and Lord Lucian ordered Lord Cardigan, who commanded the light brigade and was incidentally Lucian's brother-in-law who hated him intensely, to charge a fortified Russian artillery position at the end of the valley. If you're beginning to notice the common scenes of Lord this and Earl of such and such massively cocking up operations, you've hit upon the key problem with allowing bored aristocrats to buy officer commissions. At any rate, despite this order making as much sense as strip naked to dance to the Argentine tango with in sight of the Russian guns to demoralize the enemy, Lord Cardigan duly led his men into the teeth of the armed artillery. The net result uh, was that the Light Brigade suffered roughly 40% casualties. The Russians were very confused, and Lord Cardigan, upon seeing the battle was lost, buggered off back to his private yacht for stakes of champagne. It was that sort of war. Very nice. Uh, Anywho, we are in... Um, Memory Sequence 7. We've done three missions here, and so we have, uh, we're going to move on to our next one with Jacob. Be sure I was jumping off the right spot. Let's go see what we got. All right, we just need to get around the building, it looks like, up there. guys just sitting up here. <laughs> All right, the bodyguard. Jacob plans to warn Prime Minister of the threat to his life and question him as to the identity of the man in uniform named B. Infiltrate Disraeli's carriage. Doesn't seem like there's anybody over here. They're all going that way. Easy enough. What's the meaning of this? Who the devil are you? Prime Minister, I'm your new bodyguard. Jacob Fry. I wasn't informed of any new bodyguard. Who's your commanding officer? Let the boy speak, Dizzy. <laughs> Madam, apologies. But we've learned of a threat on your life. And the Met thought it best to move quickly. Threat? What sort of threat? <gasps> that sort. Well, if you excuse me a moment. All right, protect the carriage. Keep it damaged below 50%, okay? Oh, ow. But if they're shooting me, they're not shooting the carriage. Oh, more guys down here. guys over here okay
Easy peasy. See here. What's all this? Not so fast, Your Excellency. Uh -oh. Well, you let it get away. Hijack the carriage in less than a minute. Okay. Get off. Secure the carriage, okay? Switch to my pistol here. Well, did we get the carriage though in enough time? We did. They're both checked off. Well, that wasn't too bad. Damn Gladstone! That bloody man! He will pay for this! Thank you. What do you intend to do about Gladstone, young man? I assure you, madam, Gladstone is innocent in this. But he tried to kill my husband. Well, we'll look into Gladstone. Perhaps you can help me with another inquiry, madam. A gentleman with ties to Parliament, older, wears cavalry uniforms and has a large moustache. You seem like a rough and ready sort of fellow, Mr. Fry. Well, yes, I am, actually. And are you familiar with the poorer districts of our city? Roughly. Wonderful. As it happens, I've been eager to tour the Devil's Acre. If you... Why? I'd be happy to assist you in your inquiry. That strikes me as a dangerous idea. Then it's settled. Come back here to Downing Street tomorrow night, eight o'clock sharp. Good day, Mr. Fry. But I... Good day, Mr. Fry. It's gonna let her tell you what to do like that. All right, let's go refill our inventory. We'll go on to the next mission. Uh, four new database entries. Holy moly. All right, so we have Benjamin Disraeli. Uh, date of birth, 21st of December, 1804. Died 19th of April, 1881. A novelist, a dandy, and a man practicing law. Benjamin Disraeli, albeit surprisingly, came to be one of Europe's leading statesmen. The first and thus far only Jewish-born Prime Minister of England, Disraeli became famous for shaping the modern conservative party and for his feud with William O'Art Gladstone. Disraeli was born in London in 1804 to Isaac and Maria Disraeli. When Benjamin was 12 years of age, Isaac converted his family to the Anglican Church following a dispute with the local synagogue. Later, Benjamin would further anglicize his name from uh, Disraeli to Disraeli, <clears throat> when he went to work for Maple's law firm in 1821, though the exact motiva motivations are unknown. Possibly he got fed up with spelling it out for people. Uh, before entering the House of Commons, uh, Disraeli dipped his toe in the waters of both literature and the stock exchange. He was too fortunate that it was only his toe, too, because he found himself both a critical failure and massively in debt. Um, he suffered a nervous breakdown. Still, despite it all, he found, finally found his way into Parliament in 1837, gaining a seat in the Conservative Party. It was during this period that he forged his lifelong rivalry with Gladstone. In 1839, Disraeli married Marianne Lewis for what he thought uh, by for what was thought by many to be financial reasons, but the couple at least grew to love each other and remained bound until her death in 1872. Dizzy married me for money, Mary once stated, but if he had the chance again, he would marry me for love. Disraeli became prime minister for the first time in 1868, but failed to win that year's election. Uh, he led the opposition to majority once again in 1874, become pri becoming prime minister for a second time with a reign of lasting six years. 
suffering from gout and severe asthma. Disraeli died in 1881. Queen Victoria, with whom he had made good friends over the course of his political tenure, was distraught by his passing, but due to royal protocol, was forbidden from attending his funeral. And then we have Mary Ann Disraeli, date of birth 11 of November 1792. Mary Ann Disraeli, ni Vinny. Um, Vinny, Viney. Uh, Viscountess Beaconsfield was a prominent field in the British high society throughout much of the 19th century. She married Benjamin Disraeli in 1839, shortly after her first husband passed away, and was his constant companion, friend, and advisor until the day she died. Her affection of a silly, scatterbrained demeanor and uh, penchant for saying the sort of thing that made proper uh, Victorians waggle their mustaches disapprovingly masked a keen political mind. And between the two of them, it was joked that Benjamin married her, uh, her for money, but would do it again, but do it again for love. This is rather more charming if you realize that Marianne was quite skint when they married. Uh, it should be noted, though, that the Disraelis, both of whom were romantics to the core, had a rather trying marriage at first. Benjamin hid his extensive debts from her for years, and both felt the sting of public disapproval. The Victorian tabloids made today's Pat Boy sightings and the illegitimate alien love child look downright reputable. Rather than wallow in misery as, uh, as is the English way, the pair once again flouted convention by working out their problems and strengthening their relationship until their marriage became the storybook romance of which they had both dreamed. In 1868, the when Queen Victoria wanted to raise Disraeli to the nobility, but he preferred to stay in the House of Commons. Marianne left upon the proverbial grenade and was dubbed Viscountess Beaconsfield. Um, as ever, she made waves uh, for her refusal to abide by the accepted standards of the Victorian society. At court, her outfits frequently outdid the Queen's, and once she joined the ranks of the nobility, she seized every opportunity to show up the ladies who had once scorned her. Yet she was also active in the many charitable causes, uh, organizing aid for the less fortunate. She also put her keen political mind to work on the campaign trail with her husband, uh, winning hearts and minds through sheer baby kissing determination. By the time of her death, the Disraelis were celebrated throughout Britain as a shining example of the joy, contentment, and success a proper union should bring. Marianne Disraeli was buried along with her husband, who outlived her by several years, at the Church of St. Michael and All Angels in Hugin, Buckinghamshire. Oh, look, someone we need a band. Just a second. All right. Now that we've got that banned, sorry about that. Uh, other people, we have William Gladstone. So date of birth, 29th of December, 1809. Date of death, 19th of May, 1898. Known as, as the People's William by his supporters, uh, which is to be one of the weirdest nicknames I've ever heard, William Ewart Gladstone was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom four times and ranked one of the greatest Prime Ministers of all time. Born in Liverpool, young Willie was the fifth of six children to Anne Mackenzie and Sir John Gladstone. He attended the uh, Christ Church at Oxford, where he studied mathematics and classics, served as president of the Union Debating Society, and became an advocate for Toryism. Gladstone was elected to Parliament in 1832. In the House of Commons, he was a member of High Toryism and opposed the abolition of slavery, Eck, um, or Eek. Later, when slavery was abolished, he helped his father collect over a hundred thousand euros from or pounds from the government for having owned over two thousand slaves across nine plantations in the Caribbean. During this, his time in Parliament, he met and began to despise his lifelong rival Benjamin Disraeli, appalled by his foppish attire. Where he excelled in the House of Commons, he struggled in his social life. Gladstone had a difficult time finding a wife after being rejected by both Caroline Eliza uh, Farquhar 
and Lady Frances Harriet Douglas, he met the charming Catherine Glenn. The two were later married and stayed together for 59 years um, until he passed away because 59 years must have been uh, tiring. In 1840, Gladstone took it upon himself to have to rescue and rehabilitate prostitutes, a practice he continued for the next several decades despite the backlash from his peers. After leaving and returning to Parliament several times, Gladstone served as Chancellor of the Equator in 1859 and leader of the Liberal Party in 1868. He served his first premiership later that year until 1874 and then promptly retired. Angry with Disraeli's changes during his retirement, he returned to Parliament and served for another three times as Prime Minister, 1880 to 1885, 1886, and 1892 to 1894. Unlike his rival, Gladstone was known for his poor relations with Queen Victoria. She is quoted as having complained of him, saying, He has always addresses me as if I were a public meeting. Uh, William Gladstone died of heart failure in old age in, 19, in 1898 and was buried in Westminster Abbey. His wife later laid next to him after she died too, I mean. I'll be right back. My Roomba's bin is having an issue. I got to fix it really quick. And then we have Desmond here. Not funny, universe. Not funny at all. Jeez, what do you find in there? Sean's been locked in his room for hours, and I can't find the whiskey. I'm pretty sure I hear crying. Funny. All right. Let's go. We have a shop right here. And then let's head off to the next mission. Driving Miss Disraeli. Marianne Disraeli wants to see Devil's Acre and she requests uh, the help of her new bodyguard, Jacob. Madam? Mr. Fry? Ready to take the air? Devil's Acre should just be coming alive. I am afraid I must cancel our engagement. The lawn is crawling with scandal-hunting journalists, and I simply cannot be seen in the company of someone so... I'll see them off. You follow along when it's clear. Yes, yes. Uh, be gentle, won't you? The press are notoriously touchy about any violence to their person. <laughs> I'll barely ruffle a hair on their heads. Shh, Desmond. All right. Distract the reporters with a nearby paper girl. Okay. Well, there's our reporters. There's a green girl over here, though. That's yours, if you can get those chaps over there to follow me. Right you are, sir. Blimey! Look! It's Squire Bancroft! Best lead them astray before they turn me to- Escape the journalist.
Was that not what I needed to do? I escaped him. Reach her carriage, okay. I guess they were just too close. Neatly done, young man. Dizzy would keep you on to deal with the liberals. Now. <laughs> Escort her to Devil's Acre. All right, we just need to drive out of the area. That wasn't too bad. Doing fine here. Steady on. That's the way. Who's a good horse? You are. Do not get detected by thugs in the slum, okay? Are there lots of thugs? There's a few over there. Thanks. Give me your arm, Mr. Fry. Let us see what the Devil's Acre has to offer. Tips. Miss Disraeli's dog will bark if there's when it attracts attention, okay. Well, I took care of them. Wants us to go this way next, okay. Very industrious, I'm sure. Shall we go? No. You cannot see me. He's got a box there. Can't run with her. We're just walking with her and Desmond. Easy enough. If we just take everybody out, we can't get noticed, right? Too far away. Oh, Mr. Fly, look at those 
used to. Uh, yes, they, uh, they seem to be, um... I've been married twice, Mr. Fry. I'm fully aware of what they're doing. God bless them. <laughs> At least she's honest about it. I don't see any more guys. Best not to ask. Why? Is it something dreadful? <gasps> is it rat? I don't mean to be indelicate given the present company, but another name for it is Bow Wow Mutton. Here we are. The old one ton pub. Best beer in the Devil's Acre. Marvelous. Do you suppose we'll see a, a brawl? Why don't you have a seat and I'll fetch you a drink? <laughs> So, this is a pint, is it? Huh? <laughs> Remarkable. <sighs> nice doggy. <laughs> well, he just took her dog. Follow the park, still locate the Disney. Jeez. Desmond, hand over the mutt. You'll change your tune when me and my friends find you. <laughs> Get you back to your mistress. We have saved the miniature corgi. Left entirely unattended in one of London's most dangerous pubs. Well, if you never told your father how you felt about him, how was he supposed to know? I never thought of it that way. I suppose deep down we all just want to be loved. Just so. Mm. Here, have a sweetie. Oh, Desmond and Mr. Fry, I'd like you to meet... Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. John the Tosser. Charmed. I think we'd better get you home. Right you are, Mr. Fry. Come along, Desmond. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well. If it isn't the dog walker. <laughs> now, let's not do something we'll regret. Escape with Miss Disraeli, okay? On the right way too. Evening, Mr. Fry. No, thank you, madam. Perhaps now you might tell me about the man in the hussar's uniform. Quite right. Lord Cardigan is the gentleman you seek. Doing fine, sir. Always blathering on about his military adventures. That's a girl. Do you know where I might find him for a private conversation? I do indeed. He's in town now, as it is. Campaigning against the corrupt practices bill. Perhaps Let's you go. could catch him in the Palace of Westminster. Oh, do be careful. The government could ill afford another scandal. I assure you, I'll be very discreet. All right, we're back. Your stop, madam. I stop. <laughs> How delightful. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a splendid evening, Mr. Fry. I shall be sure to speak highly of you to Dizzy. 
<laughs> oh, yes. All right. This wasn't too bad of a mission. Okay, let's see about this last one. Motion to impeach. Okay. Not too far away. We'll just run to it. It want us to go to the all the way up, hmm. up there. Of course it is. <laughs> all right. Well, up we go. Jacob plans to assassinate the Earl of Cardigan within the Houses of Parliament. Oh. Well, within Parliament, even. What's this nonsense about needing a password to see Lord Cardigan today? Relax. I've got it in my pocket. Okay. Look sharp, men. Allow no one past unless I authorize them. Cardigan has gone too far this time. I have a mind to contact Scotland Yard myself. Come now, gentlemen. I thought us united in opposition against this perfidious law. All right, unique kill opportunity, stealth opportunity, assistance opportunity. Uh, do not kill any policemen. Do not get detected by the target. Okay. There's a lot of policemen about. I'd like to get that password. It's like that's our way in. Now we can knock out guys. We just can't kill them. So wait for him to turn around and then we'll go knock him out. Too far, didn't he? Oh, I think he'll see me. Oh, 
Oh, wait, the other one turned around, right, as I did that. Excellent. So we need a pickpocket from him. Nobody here. He comes around here, we'll just knock him out. The more we take out, the better. Do I need to kidnap him? Just need to get inside. No need for this to get messy. All right, all right. Just don't hurt me. Do not. So we're just gonna reach the hall. How much do they get past these two? Oh, they'll just let me pass. Okay, excellent. Okay, well, it says to follow him. Strange man. Where you going? Stay clear of him. He's about to start something. See, these are Templars. These are not policemen. Is that our target? Just guys. I'm in trouble now. All right, we need to find this door. Where is our target?
You don't give me any more throwing knives. There's one. that one okay well the politician didn't want to move so Still not close enough to get. There we go. One more throwing knife. Well, I wanted to follow this guy, but he didn't want to f move. And I need to not be detected, so... By him. Give password. Okay. Clava. Come in. Wow. Ah. Now then, <clears throat> let's discuss this like je Good God! Who the bloody hell? Oh, shut up. <laughs> should fall not on the gloried fields of Crimea, but to an assassin's blade in the very halls of power. Are you finished yet? Take your bow, knave, for you have managed what no Russian battery, what no Indian tiger could achieve. 
Claim your trophy. And may you choke on it. Yes, but do tell me more about Balaclava. Farewell. Farewell, dear Britannia. Your dawn shall be dimmer that the Earl of Cardigan sees it not. God save the Queen and the Eleventh Hussars. What a prick. <laughs> door out into this courtyard it's shut all these doors are shut here's an entry point Climb up there, Jacob. Just go where I tell you to. Oh my gosh, what is your problem now? Literally a big flat area up here. Easy peasy. You okay? Apart from the death squad on our tail, apart from that. Backup's on the way. Why are you pushing yourself so hard? Not your job to fight Templars. I had this colleague. He was our boss's son. I didn't much care for him to start. My Desmond. Everyone treated him like he was so bloody special. To me, he just wasn't invested in, in, in anything that didn't affect him personally. But I was wrong about him. He became my friend, put himself through hell, and he saved us all in the end. So I reckon. Well, I can't apologize to him, but I can, I don't know, I can try and live up to his example. You are a good assassin. Holy jeez! Hello. It has been too long. Galena! I mean, I have not seen you since we blew up that lab in Paris. Ah, there were many explosions and you screamed like a baby. Bishop tells me also Berg is here. I will kill him for you. Super. Great news. Now, if you wouldn't mind keeping watch, I am going to lie down and die now. Rest. We have a big fight coming. I thought she was going to, like, straight up kill him. Order has bred disorder. 
The sea rises to flood the pubs and extinguish the street lamps. Our city will die. Tupinay has failed. Lucy has failed. Brudenell, Elliotson. Pearl. All have gone into the night. It's up to me now. The assassins have brought nature's fury into our homes. Men have become monsters. Barreling toward us, teeth out. Our civilization must survive this onslaught. Prevent a return of the Dark Ages. I will start anew. London must be reborn. Hey, he's come out of hiding finally. The Peace of Eden is under Buckingham Palace. We've got all we need. Let's start planning our infiltration. Hold on. Better to get visual verification. If we're gonna move, we need to be 100% sure. We'll only get one shot before Otso Burr crashes down on us. Gotta agree with Sean. We'll position ourselves near the palace, but we'll wait for you to sync the genetic data before we move. It's all up to you, Initiate. Okay. You're late. Staric is making his move. The Peace of Eden is somewhere inside Buckingham Palace. Let him have it. I've seen your handiwork across the city. Perhaps you should trust my judgment. I've been killing Staric's henchmen. What have you been doing? Let's ask Henry, shall we? I have been repairing your mistakes. Too much haste is too little speed. Don't you quote father at me. That's Plato. And I am sorry, this doesn't involve anything you can destroy. Father was right, he never approved of your methods. Father is dead! Enough! I have just received word from my spies. At the palace ball tonight, Staric plans to steal the piece of Eden, and then eliminate all the heads of church and state. Once more, for all time's sake. And then we're finished. Agreed. So what's the plan? There's a bit of a rift growing. Such an unexpected delight to visit you both. What is the news on the street? Mrs. Disraeli, we have discovered that there is something inside Buckingham Palace that could threaten the... <laughs> what my sister's failing to say is that we require entrance into the ball tonight. Impossible! Even if there were any invitation cards remaining, which there are not, uh, someone of your lowly station... If that damn fool Gladstone is attending this evening, they can have my card. Perfect. Then I'll go alone. Mrs. Disraeli, if you would be kind enough to inform my darling brother of the location of the Gladstone's residence, perhaps he could use his considerable skills. To commandeer their cards. <laughs> what fun! Did you hear that, Dizzy? We're going to pinch the Gladstone's invitations. Thank you for volunteering me, sweet sister. Oh, a pleasure, brother dearest. Now, Mrs. Disraeli, if you would excuse me, I must visit with the Maharaja. It occurs to me that he may have a second set of plans to a certain vault. Oh, we go straight into the next mission? Treating me like a child. So, reach the Gladstone's house, don't kill any policemen. Okay, well, do I got some money in here? I should have some money in here. Got a lot of money in there. Alright. 
uh, the Templar Conspiracy. We have Lord Cardigan here. Um, Target bio, the 16th of October, 1797, died the 28th of March, 1868. Lieutenant General James Thomas Brudendell, 7th Earl of Cardigan, stands as a shining example of British aristocracy, circus the first uh, half of the 19th century, which is to say he was a pompous, blustery git who never met a failure. He couldn't buy his way out of and liked to play at soldiers with very large guns and actual human lives, or as he might have called them, peasants. He grew up in Buckinghamshire in the lap of luxury, as his father inherited the Earl of Cardigan when young James was only 14. Despite being educated at some of the finest schools in England, he never earned a degree. I can't find any record of when he joined the Templars, presumably because when you're born this rich and connected to uh, connected the doctor, uh, removes the silver spoon from your gob, slaps you on the arse... <laughs> Hands you a cross pate ring and sends you on your way. In 1818, he became a member of Parliament for Marlborough, small region of Wiltshire, regrettably lacking gristle smoking cowboys. If you're ever there, try a pint of Henry's at the Lamb. Ask for Jackie. This was convenient as his cousin owned the borough. Uh, not that that stopped him from buggering off on a grand tour of Europe before taking a seat. Mind, after all, one can hardly let little things like governance and responsibility getting in the way of gadding about with Russian noble women. When he finally did take a seat, he was an unremarkable parliamentarian and apparently an unpopular one during a campaign of 1832, despite having spent some £20,000, uh, £1,660 in today's money. He was assaulted and badly beaten in a rally. I suppose that's what happens when you loudly and frequently use phrases like reformist nonsense and preserving the ancient rights of the nobility when winning the hearts and minds of the common folk. Having failed rather remarkably in politics, he turned his attention to the military, spurred on by his youthful admiration of Wellington's cavalry at Waterloo and I suspect a love of all the pretty horses. He, and I swear I am not making this up, formed his own truce of horse to guard against reformist uprisings in Northamptonshire. When the Northern's menace failed to emerge, he joined the Hussars, where over the course of a few years, he's bought his way um, up from the lieutenant's rank to a lieutenant general in command of the 11th Hussars. Along the way, he accumulated a court-martial for reprehensible conduct, a dismissal from the army by King William himself, and a prosecution for illegal dueling, all of which he managed to have reversed or dismissed thanks to his family connections. When he finally was sent off uh, to India to take command of his forces, he spent a year and a half meandering his way to the colony, only to arrive just in time for a bit of tiger shooting before the 11th Hussars, who had been stationed there for several years, to be recalled to England. Lord Cardigan, he uh, inherited the Earl of in Earldom in 1837, uh, traveled separately aboard a private yacht because, of course, he did. If I didn't think he was such a tit, I'd love him. Despite a long and illustrious career of absolute faffery, Cardigan is most famous for leading the charge of the Light Brigade at the Battle of Balakava. Although initial rumors suggested he absented himself from the battle altogether, it seems he did in fact lead the charge from and from the front no less. Whatever his fault, he certainly possessed that breed of personal courage that comes from the certainty that the world would never dare lay a hand on you. Mind you, he also apparently never bothered to look back to see his men were being slaughtered, and upon realizing that the battle was lost, he retired to his private yacht for a champagne dinner, so it's not as though he was seized by the spirit of gallantry. After the war, Cardigan returned to England, where he spent his retirement vigorously campaigning against reform and for his own recognition as the hero of the Crimea. In his very slight uh, defense, he did contribute a great deal of money to many veterans' charities, and toward the end of his life, he campaigned in favor of the Reform Act of 1867. But since that law served chiefly to bring the House of Commons under dominance of the upper classes, that strikes me more as Templar machinations than any sort of change of heart. But at least uh, from him, we get to wear the cardigan sweater, beloved by hipsters and children's TV presenters all over the world. Uh, in our inventory, we got a new outfit here. We got the black card suit. Um, in our database here, we have Lord Cardigan's bio again. We also have Catherine Gladstone. Uh, date of birth, 6th of January, 1812. Date of birth, of, uh, date of death, 14th of June, 1900. Standing beside her husband, Catherine Gladstone's life was not as, uh, quite as public. Her father having died when she was only three, Catherine and her siblings, Mary and Stephen, were raised by their mother, 
Um, Catherine and Mary grew to be extremely close, getting married on the same day at the same venue, and Catherine acting like a mother to her children when Mary passed away in 1857. Catherine uh, met William Ewart Gladstone through her brother in 1834 and the two great people, as Mary had called the couple, married in 1839. The couple worked together for 59 years before Gladstone's death in 1898 and had eight children together. Though notoriously untidy, Catherine was a brilliant woman who devoted her life to improving the lives of others. That was pretty nice. In present day, we have Galina of Voronina, who we had just met in that cutscene. Date of birth, 30th of July, 1983. Galina and her twin sister, Advatiba, Advatia, were born in an assassin Soviet science facility in Protvino, which honestly sounds amazing. Fortunately, their lives are basically a never-ending horror movie. Their facility and team acquired a schematic for an early version of the Animus and believed that they could create the machine before Abstergo, when the assassins would gain an edge in our long war. Unfortunately, they lacked the materials and expertise to make the damn thing work. That didn't stop their mentor, Galena's mother, from forcing all the assassins into prolonged sessions, including her twin daughters. Over time, the bleeding uh, effect began to take hold, and their scientific community was driven insane. Desperate, Galena reached out for help uh, and found Gavin Banks, an assassin whose memory uh, was to uh, find surviving cells and reconnect them to the Global Brotherhood. Uh, Galena led Gavin and his uh, team back to uh, Protvino, where they euthanized the poor deranged monsters trapped inside. Galena killed her own mother and twin sister, which isn't something I think you could consider easy, even if you often squabbled. Gavin recruited her to his team, which was good for him, and he had the unfortunate habit of getting the shit kicked out of him. Galena's time in the Animus allowed her to acquire skills of her assassin ancestors, and it also may or may not have driven her crazy. One time in Norway, I saw Galena talking to herself. When I asked about it, she told me that she was talking to her dead sister, who follows her everywhere she goes. Nope, Rebecca Crane. Alright, and then in the crafting here... We had got the Iron Death Gauntlet, so we'll go ahead and craft that. And its thing says the Iron Death Gauntlet is a cold, unfeel is cold, unfeeling gray, but on the plus side, it goes with everything, including death. We also had this Nightshade Cloak that we needed to craft. Which it says, uh, regality meets darkness in this outfit. The complex uh, brocade adds... A touch of class to whatever knight's grim proceedings. And so if we go into our inventory, here's that assassin gauntlet we had just got, and we can upgrade it. Alright, let's see about finishing this mission, since it put us straight into it. Let's go out to the street. Excuse me, sir. Walk on, girl. Man, we got a long way to go. This carriage does not handle well. Let's 
Looks like we're about halfway there. Here's the Gladstone residence. Now, where can they be? The ball is tonight. They must have taken the invitations with them. Speak with the kid. You wouldn't happen to have seen two carriages pass by here just now? I did, sir. One with a man in it, the other with a woman. They split up. Where did the man go? That way. Thank you. Reach Mr. Gladstone's location. Still don't kill any policemen. Excuse me. There's all the policemen. All right, let's hop in here and see what we got. A private party event. Don't mind if I do. Oh, hi. He went way that way. He looks like he's turned around, like he might be coming back. It's just right there. Okay, well, he just started walking this way as I was going to walk forward, so I'm glad we waited a little bit.
Okay, why can't you get up there? But he didn't even get. All right. It's not where I wanted you to go. Have we here? Can't see me. Sin. In death you will pay in hell. I didn't kill him, I just knocked him out. Disappeared. Just like that. Your eyes peeled for any end. Steal it. All right, well, her invitation's over this way. Maybe I haven't been quite as delicate as I could have been, but still. I would have took one of those carriages, but there were police there. train station <laughs> Mrs. Gladstone's under guard better be cautious to wait until she's alone. should not attend the Queen's Ball without making a proper entrance. Do not damage Gladstone's carriage, okay. Talk. 
So he's got to drive carefully. Now for the invitations. What's this? Swords must be left at the door by order of the Queen. Freddy will know what to do. Steady on. That's a girl. It's all this stuff sitting still. In the way. Keep moving. Let's go. Goodness. We're there. Took that corner just a little too sharp. Urgh. That's frustrating. Not attend the Queen's ball without making a proper entrance. Go on, you're embarrassing me. Now for the invitations. <laughs> What's this? Swords must be left at the door by order of the Queen. Excuse me. Walk on, girl. But we can't bump into anything. Who's a good horse? You are. We're just gonna fall behind these blighters. Walk on, girl. That's the way. Let's go. Easy now. So where does this want me to go in? Slow down now. Someone stop that The devil's handshake schematic. Few people can drive. So what's this? another assassin's gauntlet uh they say you shouldn't shake hands with the devil but it's really more of a suggestion than a rule all right uh well we're gonna end this episode here uh as you can see in our progress tracker we because we are in sequence nine there are four missions so we still haven't unlocked the rest of these london stories so we're just gonna keep going on uh we do hope you all enjoyed the episode today we'll see you next time